The oath was basically as follows. You and each of you do solemnly promise and vow that you will pray and never cease to importune high heaven to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith on this nation, and that you will teach this to your children and your children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Have you officially renounced this oath? Or are you still bound by it? If you have not renounced it, how can you presume to lead four and one-half million people under item twelve of your articles of faith and still be bound to call upon heaven to heap curses upon our nation? We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And that's a quote directly from item twelve of the articles of faith. If you have renounced it, how can you justify having sworn such an oath to the most holy of holy places on this earth, before the sacred altar of your omnipotent God, and then renounce it? Gentlemen, I call upon you to repent of this abomination and proclaim to both the Mormon people and to the people of the United States of America that you renounce that oath and all it represents. I also call upon all members of the Mormon Church who hold office in our government, serve in the armed services, work for the FBI and CIA, who have gone through the Mormon Temple and sworn oaths of obedience and sacrifice to the Church and its leaders to repent of these oaths in the light of the obvious conflict of of men who are sworn to seek vengeance against this great nation. Sincerely signed, J. Edward Decker. He sent a copy to President Jimmy Carter and Mr. Ronald Reagan. No response, ladies and gentlemen, no response was ever received to this letter. The brethren are so powerful that they are immune to criticism and feel no need to explain themselves or account to anyone for their actions. And this seems to be the same, the same feeling of Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites, who attacked me physically in Salt Lake City at the Salt Dome and yelled at the top of his voice, quote, You will not criticize me, Cooper! Unquote. And I say, Bobo Grits, you can stick it where the sun doesn't shine. The Mormon Church already packs a political punch far out of proportion to its size. Recently, the Wall Street Journal explained how, in spite of the constitutional separation between church and state, public schools in Utah are used to instill Mormonism in young minds. You see, in the state of Utah, it is already a theocracy. It mentioned political reapportionment, airline deregulation, the basing of the MX missile and the ERA as recent political issues affected by the power of the church. For example, when the church opposed the MX for Utah, those plans were immediately dropped by the federal government. The same Wall Street Journal article quoted the following statement from J.D. Williams, a University of Utah political science professor, quote, there is a disquieting statement in Mormonism. When the leaders have spoken, the thinking has been done. To me, democracy cannot thrive in that climate. They don't have to be called to church headquarters for political instruction. They know what they're supposed to do. That's why non-Mormons can only look toward the Mormon church and wonder, What is Big Brother doing to me today? Unquote. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a more disturbing possibility. While the election of a Mormon president seems unlikely, it is highly probable under the present swing toward conventional morality and conservatism that a Mormon could one day become a Republican vice-presidential nominee. This is especially true when one considers the growing cooperation between Mormons and the moral majority. With the power, wealth, wide influence, numerous highly placed Mormons, and large voting bloc under their virtual control, the Brethren have a great deal to offer a Republican presidential candidate. Let's assume that a Mormon vice presidential candidate is on the winning ticket and thereafter the president dies in office or is assassinated, causing the Mormon to succeed him as president of the United States. And we know that the order assassinated John F. Kennedy in the outdoor temple of the sun known as Dealey Plaza. We also know that the clamor for a savior in the United States of America is reaching unprecedented proportions and many are looking many are looking to H. Ross Perot, 
who will cast around and maybe, maybe choose someone like Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz as his vice presidential running mate? Or is it possible that Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz could himself be elected to the presidency of the United States of America in this climate of absolute chaos which the order, the Illuminati, has created with the help of people like Tom Valentine and organizations like the Liberty Lobby? Is this a possibility? Are you listening to me, sheeple? There is every reason to believe that the new president would immediately begin to gather around him increasing numbers of zealous temple Mormons in strategic places at the highest levels of government. A crisis similar to the one which Mormon prophecies, quote, foretold, unquote, occurs in which millions of Mormons, with their year's supply of food, guns, and ammunition, play a key role. It would be a time of excitement and zealous effort by the saints to fulfill Joseph Smith's and Brigham Young's, quote, prophecy, unquote. Quote, the time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread. At that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from the threatened destruction, unquote. Not only does Mormonism predict the, quote, saving, unquote, of America, but the precedent for an attempted takeover by force of subterfuge through political means has been set by the founding prophet himself. In 1834, Joseph Smith organized an army and marched toward Independence, Missouri to, quote, redeem Zion, end quote, in spite of a humiliating surrender to the Missouri militia that proved his bold prophecies false and therefore that he could not possibly be a real prophet, as the Mormon church proclaims, ignoring that a prophet cannot possibly be wrong. The prophet later formed the Nauvoo Legion and commissioned himself a lieutenant general to command it. Lyman L. Woods stated, quote, I have seen him on a white horse wearing the uniform of a general. He was leading a parade of the legion and looked like a god, unquote. Joseph Smith was not only ordained king on earth, but he ran for president of the United States just before his death, at which time Mormon missionaries across the country became, quote, a vast force of political power, unquote. Today's church leaders are urging Mormons to prepare themselves for the coming crisis in order to succeed where past saints have failed. A recent major article in Ensign about being prepared included this oft-repeated warning reminder. Quote, The commandment to reestablish Zion became for the saints of Joseph Smith's day the central goal of the church, but it was a goal the church did not realize because its people were not fully prepared. Unquote. Going back, ladies and gentlemen, going back to our hypothetical crisis, what Mormons unsuccessfully attempted against impossible odds in the past, they might very well accomplish with much better odds in this future scenario. They are building a hero, a demagogue, someone who could well become a vice president and will, in fact, be a presidential candidate, Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz, and under cover of the national and international crisis, the Mormon President of the United States acts boldly and decisively to assume dictatorial powers. With the help of the brethren and Mormons everywhere, he appears to save America and becomes a national hero. At this time, he is made Prophet and President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Mormon Kingdom of God, while still President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no provision in the Constitution to prevent this. With the government largely in the hands of increasing numbers of Mormon appointees at all levels throughout the United States, the constitutional prohibition against the establishment of a state church would no longer be enforceable. Mormon prophecies and the curse upon which the United States government in revenge for the blood of Joseph and Hiram Smith would seemingly have been fulfilled. In effect, the United States would have become a theocracy exactly as planned by the brethren, completing the first step in the Mormon takeover of the world. 
President John Taylor boasted of it 100 years ago. He said, quote, Let us now notice our political position in the world. What are we going to do? We are going to possess the earth and reign over it forever and ever. Of course, he was speaking for the collective secret brotherhood known as the Illuminati. Now ye king...